Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Skillshare session on sewing machine repair and maintenance. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome back Jenny Caminada this evening. For more than 10 years, Jenny has run Cheeky Handmaids, where she teaches people how to sew and look after the sewing machines. Uh, Jenny has also run some of our most popular Skillshares in the past, again, about sewing machines. So we're really delighted to welcome her back this evening. And Jenny's a real expert, so it's a real treat to have her talking to us this evening. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jenny. Jenny, the floor is yours. Oh, Jenny, you're still muted. There you go. I'm unmuted now. Um, yes, I mean, the other thing I totally forgot to say, James, that um, the other thing I have been doing, which is also very repair related, is I've been repairing and restoring vintage quilts in the last few years and lots of them, which is amazing. So I know it's got nothing to do with sewing machines, but it's, you know, people would otherwise have thrown things in the bin and now they come to me and I restore them. So that's beautiful, beautiful thing to do. But yeah, so my passion is repairing and making sure that people can and uh, enabling people to repair themselves. You know, it's, I don't always want people to come to me with the basic stuff. It's much ha I'm much happier if people know how to look after their sewing machines. Basic looking after your sewing machines, really, really simple. Um, I mean, ultimately, it all starts with having a, a decent ish sewing machine. So there are certain brands that are just literally sold and they are you know they just never work very well so some things just can't be repaired and that is sad and I wish that those things wouldn't be sold at all because they're not even cheap and ultimately in the end of course they're very expensive because you can't fix them but most sewing machines don't take it's not difficult to look after them so I want to just I'm going to put my camera I'm going to flip the screen around and I'm going to put it in my other stand so that we can get straight in because it seems like we have oodles of time but remarkably it flies by so there we go so i have got two sewing machines set up here um just because they both have different bobbin systems everything else is the same um and i'm just going to mainly concentrate on this one but i'll show you the bobbin on the other one as well so i first want to start with the biggest problem with sewing machines the most the biggest reason why people come to me with sewing machines that are not working or not working very well is the needle that they use. And I had an interesting chat with a sewing machine repair shop in the north of England online today where they did exactly that. They posted a picture of a needle that somebody had in their sewing machine and the needle wasn't straight as in here. Let me try and zoom in a little bit more. Hmm, don't know why it won't zoom in. Anyway, I'll just bring this a bit closer. To, um, at the front of the needle, there's an eye, and this needle, the eye was set off slightly to the side. Now, of course, that's never going to work very well. And you would be surprised at how many needles are utter rubbish straight out of the packet. A friend of mine bought some needles on the local market, and some of them didn't have an eye, and some of them didn't even have a point. So that's obviously not even a needle. But lots of needles, you, you buy them, and they are rough at the bottom. And they, of course, your machine sews at incredibly high speed. And what it does is it has a very nar narrow margin of error. It needs to pick up that bo bobbin thread at high speed. If the needle at the bottom is slightly blunt or a bit barbed, you know, in any way rough, or like I said, if the, need the eye is set off to the side. I've even seen needles that are up to a millimeter too short. Now, if the needle isn't long enough, it just won't go in and pick up that bobbin thread. So over the years, I've tested and discarded all sewing machine needles, and the only make that I use now is Schmetch. And interestingly, the shops are exactly the same. So um, you can't usually buy them in shops, you know, on the high street or anything, not, not even big department stores or sewing machine shops, uh, sorry, sewing shops. So I buy mine online and I buy them in big boxes of 100 because honestly, even, you know, good quality needles, they need to be replaced every six sewing hours. And if you are, if you've hit a pin or you've done some really chunky seams or you've gone through a fabric with, which has metallic threads in it, your needle will be blunt much more quickly um, or damaged even. So if you do find that your machine has been working fine and suddenly it's behaving badly, so you might have loops at the back of your fabric or it might be skipping stitches, I guarantee you it will be the needle. I'm going to try and bring this a little bit nearer. I don't know why it won't zoom in, but there you go. Um, so what I tend to do every now and then is just run my finger. In fact, I'm going to run my pinky finger 
around the bottom of the needle. It should feel completely smooth. It's going to put the handle up a little bit higher. It also should be sharp enough to pick up the skin of your finger still. Okay. If either of those two things isn't happening, if you feel any kind of burrs or if the needle isn't sharp anymore, replace it because it will not be working very well. So do always make sure you have spare needles because there's nothing more frustrating than having to carry on with a needle that's damaged and is causing problems because you don't have another one to hand. So have a bunch of needles to hand always. And if you are sewing and if you're naughty like me where sometimes you leave your pins in and you go slowly, obviously, because if you go fast over a pin, you can absolutely kill your machine. But if you go slowly and your needle hits a pin, then you will probably have to replace it straight away. So you might be able to limp to the end of that particular seam, but that's the end of that then. So good quality needles. So Smetch needles come in as with all needles, really. Lots of different sizes. So it's got the size on the front of the box there. It also has lots of different kinds of needles. So for jersey fabric and leather and universal needles. So I'm just using a universal one here. I tend to use size 90 for pretty much everything unless I'm making jeans. So if you look at a sewing machine needle, it's got a flat bit and a rounded bit. So the flat bit of the uh, shaft of the needle needs to go in towards the back of the machine. Unless you have a really old sewing machine. If you have a machine where the bobbin is to the left-hand side of the needle, then your needle will also go in turned. So the, need, the flat bit of the needle really points away from the bobbin area. So like I said, if it's all, um, put in sideways very very rarely you might have a really old singer sewing machine where the needle goes in the other way around so you would thread it up from the right to the left often though it will have a little marking on this on the stitch plate here it will have a little arrow because honestly the first time I came across that I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working and it's because the needle was in a very unusual way but nowadays 99% of machines if not more the needle is the bobbin is facing you know it's in front of the needle and the flat bit of the needle faces away from you so you okay. have We've answered had a few questions already um, okay yeah take a few Go for uh, it. so the first one is from elaine who asks yep. uh, yeah what needles mm -hmm. are best to use uh, on leather so leather needles are the only ones that you can use on leather they're basically slightly triangular shaped and they cut a slit into the leather if you just cut a hole um it doesn't work very well so you need special leather needles um, and you might have to buy them online you might not find them in you know your sort of local fabric shop um i'm struggling getting this needle in because i've got my my camera is kind of in the way <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm going to have to move this out of the way a little bit so i can get my hands in there um yeah so there is lots of different kinds of needles you can get um, and I mean, I don't sew with leather. You you kind of need a special foot as well. So like a Teflon E foot that doesn't um, doesn't stick to your leather. There we go. We're in. So there we go. Um, yes. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, three more actually. So yeah. uh, question from Rob: uh, Are all needles the same length for all machines? Pretty much, yes, nowadays. So there's some very, very, very old sewing machines where the needles, the top of the needle is circular and the whole needle is very thin. Um, you can still buy them. There is still a company that makes them, but um, unless your machine is sort of pre-1920s, you're unlikely to need one of those. They're very fragile and super expensive. Industrial machines have different sewing machine needles. They have a round shank all the way up, so don't ever try and use those in your domestic machine because they're a different size. Um, I do believe that some needles, I think organ needles are specific to Japanese sewing machines and they're ever so slightly shorter. Um, but I have found they're mostly quite blunt nowadays as well. So I don't use them at all anymore, but literally all modern sewing machines, unless it's an industrial machines, all needles will fit all machines. Um, so that's good to know, right? <laughs> that's great to know. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, just two more. So yep. um, question from Lee who's wondering about ballpoint needles and whether yes. they're less sharp than normal ones. And if they yes. are, can they get blunt too? Uh -huh. Well, they're blunt to start with. They're basically, when you look at them up close, they have a ballpoint end and they are specifically for sewing with knitted fabric. So what they do is they don't cut a hole in the fabric. They actually push in between the threads and 
you know, if if you imagine you you snag a hole in a pair of tights and it starts laddering, if you use the normal needle on jersey, then there's every chance you end up with little holes where the needle has punctured the threads. Um, so a jersey needle um, will just push those threads aside. Um, I don't use them often enough. I've never actually really thought about whether they can get blunt. Yes, I'm sure. Well, they're kind of blunt to start with, so they probably will last a lot longer. <laughs> actually um because these these are also called sharps and they have to be super sharp but um yeah good question i'm not 100 percent sure how long you can la make them last but probably quite a bit longer so i mean what i also tend to do if i'm using a different needle for a different project i just take this one out i don't throw it i've got one of those cheap tomato pin cushions and i've marked different sizes and i just put my needles in there for safekeeping and then i could just go back and reuse them but i do always test them i always before i put them back in i just make sure they're still sharp and still smooth brilliant perfect uh, and then the final one for now um Adel asks um regarding ballpoint needles uh, yeah they've also seen stretch needles um, and they're wondering what the difference is yes yeah, so i've never i'm never entirely sure what the difference is either there's in fact loads of different kind of needles that you can use on knitted fabric so i was doing a little bit of reading up today i've been using microtex needles so they're specifically for fabric that have some sort of elastic in them such as lycra or what have you so they are super 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 sharp and super thin so that they don't get kind of caught on the elastic because otherwise you might find that you get a bit of drag on the needle as it goes in and comes out and it starts skipping stitches because it's literally being slowed down by a nanosecond as it goes in and out. Um, I've never, I kind of use ballpoint, you know, the jersey and the stretch ones interchangeably. I've never actually figured out what the difference is. I'm sure there is one, but you often find that you can just use them interchangeably. Um, but there is, you know, it's just a case of giving it a go. But recently I've been making a, a few swimsuits, obviously, because I'm going on holiday. And so they definitely need microtex needles or even non-stick um, microtex needles because the elastic in the swimsuit material just, you know, you, you just can't sew a straight line without it skipping all over the place. Great. Well, good to know. Thank you. Um, yeah. That's it for questions for, for now. Some thanks okay. in the chat from people. Yeah, so I would say 90% of sewing machine repairs are due to, you know, I just changed the needle and they're basically fine again. So, which is kind of heartbreaking because I would like people to understand and I've got it on my website and at the bottom of my email address, please just change your needle before you call me because it's probably that. And people don't generally believe me. They want to, you know, think that there's something a bit more hideously wrong with their sewing machine, but honestly it resolves so many problems. And, you know, the other thing is sometimes you just need to refread your sewing machine because it might just be that it's not entirely caught in one of the, you know, gubbinses or hooks or what have you. So if you think that it's definitely not the needle, you've got a new needle in there and it's still being a bit weird, then just refread the whole lot, take the bobbin out, put it back on. So which brings me to, well, actually let's do things in order. So thread is also incredibly important. So I'm going to show you some thread that you shouldn't use. This lovely stuff here is vintage thread. So the problem with vintage thread, it's it's often cotton and cotton rots over time, as we are all aware when you've picked up a vintage sheet or a vintage dress and literally you, you just pull it apart. So vintage thread often just uh, has no strength left in it at all. And there is a lot of tension that goes on to the thread when it goes through the sewing machine. So cotton thread is a no-no. And you can buy modern cotton threads too. You can buy threads that you know are specifically for quilting or what have you. And they're just not very strong. So for hand sewing, great. But I know people, I love, you know, I only use cotton to sew with, as in make, you know, cotton fabric, but I would never use cotton thread. It's just not strong enough. And it often snaps as it goes through your machine. The other absolute no-no is this nonsense from the pound shop. So it looks you know, you've, it looks like you might be getting a good deal because you get 24 colours for a pound, but actually there's almost no thread on there. It is terrible quality. Um, often the end of the spool is really um, barbed and your thread will kind of snap as it comes off. So no thank you. That can go straight in the bin. There, I, I confiscate these. When I have students turn up or people with broken sewing machines, you know, I literally go, right, you're not allowed to have that back because that should never go near a sewing machine. So... The Penny, stuff before that we I move do... on, yep. sorry to interrupt, uh, we've got That's one okay. final question on needles before we yep. dive into threads. 
Yeah. Um, and it's a question from Gwen who asks, is there a method to check whether the needle is straight? I've never, I just tend to look at it by eye, to be honest. I mean, if you have any doubt, you would also know the hole that the needle goes into isn't very big, really. So if your needle is hitting the stitch plate, then instantly change it, okay? So I would say if you, if you are in any doubt at all that your needle is straight, if you've hit something with it, if it's hit the foot or it's hit a button or it's hit the stitch plate, then you should change it anyway. You should never really risk putting it back in because you can end up causing really quite severe damage if your needle is hitting the stitch plate you know, over and over. So I would say if you're not entirely sure, just chuck it and start again. I mean, the needles are like 10p each or something. So um, I would not I would not risk it. Um, okay, just thanks. quickly back to Fred then, good makes of Fred, so I tend to use, I mean this stuff is cheap, this is from the market, this is like 70p or something for 500 metres, it's absolutely fine for pretty much everything, and then if you want to splash out, there's Gutterman, I don't know if you can see it properly, Gutterman Fred, or Coates um, Duet Fred, so they are, I mean there's loads of other brands out there and you can spend a fortune on Freds, but those are easily found in most shops. They're super strong, they're very smooth, so they're just really easy to use and your machine will love you for it. So those are good threads to use and they don't have to cost a lot of money, but yeah, stay away from the pan shop stuff. And then just very quickly, the other thing that's often, I've got a whole box of bobbins that I've had to take off people. There you go. So these are all the bobbins that have come out of sewing machines where the bobbins were just the wrong size for the machine. So not all bobbins are the same size. So this is a standard bobbin. Now you can get them either in plastic or in metal. I think they're called class 15. So this is pretty much a universal bobbin for machines nowadays. Okay, um, very occasionally, so faff sewing machines, I think this might be a faff bobbin. So it's actually slightly less tall than a normal bobbin. And some of them are also slightly wider. So be very, very, very careful that you don't put the wrong bobbin in your sewing machine. Obviously, if your machine takes a shallow bobbin and you put a taller one in, you'll end up breaking something. If you put a bobbin in that's too small. So this one is really ditty. It's really small, it's got curved edges. Um, it's too shallow compared to the other ones. And it's also not wide enough. So if you put this in a normal bobbin, case then it just moves around whilst it's working you know whilst it's sewing and it causes all kinds of tension issues so often people just go well you know I've inherited all this stuff from my auntie and I'm just using all the bobbins that are in the baskets and then you find a whole collection of random bobbins so be very very careful also don't buy bobbins from the pound shop or even the market I've bought bobbins or I've seen bobbins rather where the edges are really rough. Now this needs to be smooth, otherwise your thread will just um, snag and, and break. I've also seen bobbins where the hole in the middle isn't big enough to go onto the bobbin winding system. So obviously that makes it quite a difficult bobbin to use. So do make sure, and if there is any snags on your bobbin, if somebody stood on it, then you know throw it away probably or what I do use and this is the tool that I use a lot in my sewing machine so this is um, this is the, my main repair tool it's a nail file cheap nail file and so if there is any snags on the bobbin on a plastic bobbin case you just file it off file it down until it's nice and smooth again so um, but obviously if somebody stood on it and there's jaggedy edges then it just needs to go because it causes untold problems um, so then the other thing I want to um, sort of jump onto is the damage that can happen when you hit the needle on the stitch plate or gets the needle trapped in the bobbin case. So this bobbin system here, the drop-in bobbin, is more and more and more common. So the other bobbin system, I'll just move this, move my camera across for a minute. There we go. So this bobbin system here, front loading bobbin system with a metal bobbin. It's a bit more of a pain to thread up and you can't see how much thread is on the bobbin. So if you run out, it's annoying, but it's a really strong system. You can take all of this apart. We'll come to that in a minute. I'll take it all apart. You can take it all apart, clean it out, put it back together and it will. it's virtually indestructible. Whereas these bobbin systems, I mean, this is a ridiculously expensive sewing machine I'm working on here, and the bobbin system is fragile. It's just not a, not a strong bobbin system. So, um, 
And so what can happen is, in fact, I'll show you the bobbin case I've just had to replace. So I've had this machine a year and a half and I'm super careful with things. Obviously, I don't get things trapped. I don't break needles, really. But this is the state of this bobbin case. I don't know if you can see. Um, it's got rough edges all along here where once the needle hit it and it's easily done. So there's a rough edge here. There's more damage around the back here where the needle has scraped all along. So it's gone into the back here. I've seen bobbin cases like this where this bit here is punctured with holes from the sewing machine because it isn't very strong. So the machine will easily chase the needle into that bit there. So I'm just going to lift. So this machine has got a really easy way to remove the stitch plate. Normally you've got screws here and you, your machine is usually comes with a little screwdriver like this or even a little sort of metal triangle that removes those screws this one i just plop plop it out so to speak and just as you're removing the bobbin uh the, the plate yeah. there jenny i've got a yeah. couple of questions about bobbins yes go for it uh the first is uh which is best plastic or metal bobbins there is no real difference so they are both equally good um, if your eyesight is not perfect anymore, then you might find that the holes in the metal bobbins are easier to thread up if that's how you connect your thread before sticking it on the bobbin winder. Um, um, but most machines are delivered with plastic bobbins and they're perfectly fine. They just obviously don't withstand being stood on. That's really the only thing. <laughs> but there is no difference in terms of, you know, what, what I prefer to use. So it, it's I just use whatever is, is to hand. Perfect. Um, and then the second question from Evil is, yep. if you inherited miscellaneous bobbins, how do you tell which ones are right? Yes. So the, the, the how you tell is this. I'm just going to move the machine out of the way a little bit. So the, if this is the correct bobbin for your machine, and this is a random bobbin you've inherited, I don't know if you can see, there's about a millimetre height difference. And then if you hold them together like that, these are actually the same diameter, but often you find ones that just aren't. So the diameter might be completely different. So these two here, this is a vintage Singer bobbin and it's actually smaller. It's smaller by about a millimeter. So I would just check the handbook. If you're not entirely sure what the what bobbins your machine needs, the handbook will absolutely tell you. So nowadays the, the mach machine handbook might not tell you because they just presume that it's everyone uses the same bobbins. But on vintage machines, it tends to tell you what it needs. So, and you can still buy these, you know, you can just go on eBay or whatever, and lots of sewing machine shops still stock them because lots of people do still use machines that were made in the 50s, 60s, 70s, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, you can still buy them, but do make sure that, and if you're really not 100% sure, just check, you know, if you put your bobbin in, into your bobbin case, then see if it sits nicely. It shouldn't wobble around too much. It shouldn't stick out. It shouldn't sit too deep. So that is, you know, a, like a visual gauge. If your machine is working happily with the bobbin that's in there, then that's probably the correct one. You will notice if it's got the wrong bobbin in, it just won't work very well. Um, so yes, these bobbin cases here, they are fragile. They very easily lift out. And sometimes it happens when you've got some thread is jammed, you know, maybe you started with the foot up or something's happened and you've got some thread jammed around here. Then on one of those metal bobbin cases, you just, the machine just stops and you have to take everything apart to get the thread out. On these ones, what can sometimes happen is that this lifts out and then this lifts over the top. So I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit more. This this thing here, this little pin on the bobbin case, this bit here needs to sit to the left of that. And the bobbin case needs to be in, so it sits smoothly in there, okay? So what should never happen is that the bobbin case goes in like that, but it will, if you've accidentally pulled it out with a bunch of threads stuck in there, then it will, or, you know, and it will carry on sewing even though it's not in there properly. And then what happens is the needle hits that point there or even all the way around. And before you know it, even with someone as careful as me who knows what they're doing, you end up with the points all damaged like that. So what can often be done, I'm just gonna pull my camera back a little bit again so I've got a bit more space. So when I get a machine where somebody has very obviously hit, you know, broken a needle on, on their machine, um, 
then often what you can do is just file that point down with, with a needle file, uh, a nail file. So if you just file it down, and if you've got any damage underneath here, just file it away, make sure it's smooth again. Um, it was too late to save mine. I had to actually buy a new one and that cost me about 40 quid. So that was kind of annoying. Um, but likewise on the metal bobbins, so the bobbin is absolutely fine. It's almost indestructible that. And I'm just going to move my camera across to the other bobbin system here. Let's see, I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna put this in front. So I do, I have to say, I'm very fond of these bobbin systems because they're so much more, they're so much sturdier. They're almost indestructible. So I'm just going to take this apart. So I hope you can see in there properly. So this is fairly universal. There usually will be two catches that hold this in. If you have a vintage sewing machine, this might be quite different. There might be a screw at the bottom that holds all this in. You can basically, let me just take the needle up first. There we go. So I've taken the bobbin case, the, the bobbin and the bobbin case out. So I'm just moving this across and then all of this comes out. So this is also a really useful thing to do. Every now and then you want to just go in here and remove the fluff and the bits of thread. If you've got a big thread jam, you know, literally everything's stuck underneath there, then please do just take this apart. It's yours to take apart. It can't break, by, you know, if you do that. But what you might find if you've had a big needle break, then even on this metal bobbin uh, system, you might find that this has become a bit damaged. So if this feels in any way rough, now just file it down, it makes a huge difference. If this point is smooth again, it will go back to picking up the thread properly. So if you've changed your needle, you've done everything, you've re-threaded your machine and it's still not picking up the thread consistently, then it may well be that. So just check that point there. And also actually, whilst we've got it open, I just realized I didn't get any oil, but we can just pretend, I mean, as in it's upstairs. So, even though these modern machines are supposed to be self-oiling and you're not supposed to have to do anything to them, what I quite often will do is just put a drop of oil. So I tend to tilt the machine back, put a drop of oil in here and then another one behind here. And then without having the machine threaded up, I just put my foot on the pedal and run the oil through a little bit because it does really like having that bit oiled. I mean, you just imagine it works away constantly. It gets bits of fluff dropped in there. It does really like a bit of oil in there every now and then. You can't really open the rest of the machine easily. Um, and the rest of the system ha probably has all kinds of grease on it rather than oil. And um, by the way, to put this back together again, um, maybe I should do this a bit more slowly actually. Um, basically take note when you take it apart, <laughs> but there's a half moon shape here that goes up against the half moon shape that's still in the machine. I tend to tilt the machine back a little bit because none of this clicks in. So if you have the machine standing up, you might just find it keeps falling out. This bit here, there's an opening at the top. So that goes, well, there's an opening there that goes at the top so where the needle goes in. These sticky outy bits need to face you because once all this is back together again, that's where the catches go over. And it is important that you put those catches back on. Okay, and now we can put the bobbin back in. Like I said, these bobbins don't tend to sustain much damage really. I mean, every now and then you might find that, you know, this, this little slidey bit here might get damaged. In fact, I'll leave it out because I want to talk about sort of bobbin tension next. But yes, if anything gets damaged in those metal systems, it's all replaceable also. You can buy new bobbin cases. Um, and they're like a fiver, and then you have a whole new bobbin case. They're mostly universal. Beninas have slightly different ones, and possibly FAF have different ones too. Um, industrial machines obviously have quite different bobbin cases, but this is a, a universal bobbin case and it will fit almost all machines. So, um, mm. is there any questions at this stage? I'm sure there is. Yeah, I was about to say, um, yeah, we do have a few questions. Uh, yeah. So, a couple on bobbins. Yeah. Um, so Giles, kind of following up from the other question about telling the difference between which bobbin fits and which one doesn't. Yeah. He's asking if you inherit a lot of bobbins, um, how do you visually check which ones fit best? Right. So there really isn't, there isn't a hundred different kinds of bobbins. So I think the four that I have here are probably the main ones. So 
There were some, Singer went through a weird experimental phase in the 70s and they did have a few bobbins that were really wide and really shallow. You would probably not likely to have those. But I would say if you are looking at, if you're looking at your bobbins, you can quite quickly see, it might be difficult for you to see, but from where I'm sitting, it's really obvious that this one is much smaller than the other ones. And then when I look a bit harder, then that one is also quite a bit smaller. So I would say, you know, class them by size and then check. But it isn't, it isn't the case that there are some bobbins that are half a millimeter smaller than that and others that are half a millimeter taller. I'm fairly sure that other than, you know, like I said, some weird 1970s bobbins, <laughs> um, these are kind of the main ones that you come across. I didn't have any in my box of bobbins that I've taken off errant sewing machines. Um, and, you know, I do this a lot. So I would say you, you're not all, all that likely to have anything else other than this. Great, thanks. Um, next question uh, is from Elaine again. Yeah. Uh, who says, sorry, silly question. Do you have nope. bobbins ready wound with the color thread that you need to match the top oh, thread? Oh, rubbish, yes. No, <laughs> they are really often incredibly awful quality. So the other really important thing when you're sewing, I mean, when you want a nice stitch, is that you use the same quality thread on the top as you do on the bobbin and, um, you know, and it doesn't matter if the color doesn't match, but it is important that the quality matters. So if you have an expensive thread on the bobbin and you have a cotton thread or a pound shop thread on the top, the two don't really ever match very well. And you might just find your stitches are consistently not nice. So if you buy pre-wound bobbins, you have no idea what the quality of the thread on the bobbin is. And often they're also really shocking size. So the bobbins, they're often made of paper or really, really thin plastic and they're almost disposable. The only um, exception to this is you can buy pre-wound bobbins for embroidery machines. And I did always poo-poo them, but I recently did an online embroidery class and were told that actually they are really, really, really good because they are wound up. They are wound up with really high quality thread, but they're also not cheap. So if you are looking at buying, you know, 50 wound up bobbins in all the colors of the rainbow and it's going to set you back 4.99 you can guarantee that the bobbins are not going to fit and the quality is going to be shocking of you know the quality of thread and also you don't know what threads on the bobbin so you don't know what to match it with on top but i dare say it's probably this kind of quality so i would steer well away from those nice as they look also it doesn't take that long to wind up a bobbin <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, that makes sense. Uh, and Elaine had a kind of follow-up question, which was um, also, can you gauge how much thread will last you, uh, what you need to sew with? Yeah, you get better and better and better at that as you as you are get more experience. So I would say always put slightly more on than you think you might need. So with the expensive thread, if I'm using the Gutterman thread, for example, if I put too much thread on the bobbin, then either I keep the bobbin with the thread, you can get little um, spiky things that go into the, into the bobbin on one side and into the spool of thread on the other side to keep the two together or I just take the bobbin thread off and put it back on here if it is cheaper thread then I tend to just leave it on for future use but you know you might not need it but there is nothing more frustrating than almost being finished with something and then finding your bobbin thread has run out especially as on most sewing machines it doesn't tell you and you don't notice sometimes for ages and you've been sewing and you've taken all the pins out and yada, 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 and then you've got no thread on there. So, but you do get quite good at, at knowing how much you need. Although we all, you know, play thread chicken sometimes where you might win or you might not win <laughs> in terms of how much you've got. Um, but yeah, this, for example, that's quite a lot. I would say I could maybe make a pair of curtains with that or, you know, to make, if I start a dress, for example, or a pair of dungarees, then I would fill the bobbin all the way up, but I probably won't use it all, really, unless there's lots of zigzagging and what have you. Brilliant. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Richard and Dave have got questions about um, oil. Yeah. Or, or, well, <laughs> or rather, um, Richard's keen to know what your thoughts are on using silicon spray rather than oil. And Dave was asking about PTFE instead. Oof, I don't even know what PTFE is. Me, no me idea neither. at all. No. Um, Dave, Sorry? can you can you tell us in the chat what, what do you mean by PTFE? Um, and in the meantime, what do you think about silicon spray? 
no also no basically the only oil that's good for sewing machines it's sewing machine oil and i just buy it by the liter and then distribute it into little bottles and i've even got sort of little syringes to reach how to reach areas but i've not seen anything else that does the job the only thing is inside the mechanism of the sewing machine so if i was to go inside here then i will use um on the gears and things like that, I use grease that I've bought. I think it's axle grease that I've bought from a car shop. But all this stuff in here, sewing machine is one of the lightest, non non stickiest oil you can get. And if you use anything else, then it just starts congealing and and clogging things together. So old oil also will cause big problems. So if you if your machine hasn't been used in thirty years, then actually sometimes the biggest problem is the old oil has turned into like a hard it's almost like chewing gum and it just clogs everything up. But I tend to find that using new oil will eventually cut through that. And if it's really bad, I'll use a little bit of WD-40, but that you don't have to re-oil everything because it actually gets rid of oil. It doesn't oil things. But no, I wouldn't use silicon spray. Oil is perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, it has to be sewing machine oil. I've come across, recently I came across a sewing machine where the lady had been consistently putting three in one oil on it and the whole machine was black on the inside and it's sticky everything was stuck together so that is an absolute no-no um not olive oil nothing <laughs> and so machine oil is really cheap and it's really easy to get hold of and most machines even come with a little bit of oil when you first buy them so there really is no excuse not to use that i would say perfect cool thanks jenny and we've had some clarification on ptfe yeah, apparently is I'm gonna I'm gonna say this wrong. Apologies. Uh, yeah. Polytetrafluoroethylene, right. or Teflon dry slash dry. Oh, okay. No, no. Also, no. I don't think. I mean, there is sewing machine oil just does the job. It lubricates. It keeps everything running smoothly. I wouldn't introduce anything else. It also sounds like it would be more expensive, but um, it's just not necessary. Oil does the job perfectly, has been doing for over a hundred years. So um, that, that's what you need. And th that's the one thing you could even buy from the pound shop because it just doesn't matter. It's always the same stuff really. Um, Perfect. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, Darren had a question about bobbins, but I think Darren, if you, uh, we've kind of covered that already. So if you check the recording, once it goes live, um, Jenny goes over that in some detail uh, about finding the, the correct type of bobbin. Yes. Uh, and then Helen had a question as well about um, the sewing machine oil deteriorate deteriorate with time and it sounds like it, it does it probably can do a bit yeah so I'm just going to pull this bottle of oil off the shelf actually if you just bear with me a second so this has been in my studio and it's been near the radiator right we we'll bring this over so this oil has gone quite dark so normally it's much more see-through than that um I would still use it but it's probably just become a bit impure but it's not like you know olive oil or vegetable oil where it goes rancid I've never come across that but I yeah I probably wouldn't buy a litre bottle unless you are you know an industrial user um like I am because it can go a bit weird after time in fact this might even have sediment in it so that's probably no good I'm not going to use that anymore um whilst I've got this machine open by the way I'm just going to quickly show you again they're supposed to be self-oiling but even these machines do quite like a little drop of oil in this actually little wick in the center of this so if you put a drop of oil in there so the main thing with oiling your machine is don't over oil it i have actually seen flames come out of a machine because it was really stuck it was a really stuck machine and i you know what i tend to do with machines that haven't been used for a long time if they're very stuck I put a bit of oil on, I run it through, and then I leave it for a few days. I put a bit more oil in. I might even tilt the machine on its side and let it sit on its side for a day, et cetera, et cetera. And this one, I'd had to use so much oil over time that eventually when I next plugged it in, it got, the oil got hot and then it like a flame came out of the bobbin area. It was absolutely fine because it was an all metal sewing machine. It was totally fine. And then I was retelling this story to a student at the weekend and he said, oh, my dad, um, 
is a tailor and they regularly used to um, burn off all the fluffs and stuff from their industrial sewing machines by just running a flame across it. So a bit like a stubble burning. <laughs> I don't know whether this, this was common practice, but anyway, he said it was, I mean, it was, like I said, it was fine anyway, but you don't want to over oil. You don't need to put tons and tons and tons of oil on. Generally, if it's oiling just for maintenance purposes, just a drop in all the bits that you can see moving. So here, everything that moves around, um, just don't, you know, no oil on the motor, no oil on any rubber belts you might see, et cetera, et cetera. But other than that, bit of oil. And then, like I said, just put your foot on. Oh, it's not, it, this machine is a bit, um, it won't work unless I put the stitch plate back on. So let's do that. And then you can just put, So just run it through to get the oil moving around the machine. I even recently bought myself a hair dryer. I don't use one for my hair, but I bought one to warm the oil up. If I've got a really old stubborn machine that's a bit stuck, then sometimes just warming it up a little bit just releases everything a bit. So definitely worth doing. Um, the other thing I just wanted to show you, so there are other issues that can happen when you, if your needle hits the stitch plate. So this one, is in pretty good condition obviously because it's mine and I don't generally break needles but I recently saw one and this is again not unusual where that's it uh, I'm just going to show you like that where the whole edge of the whole where the needle goes in looked like it'd been chewed by you know rats with very small sharp teeth um every time your needle hits this stitch plate or breaks it takes a little dent out of this corner here and it, the whole edge was so rough every bit of thread that was going up and down it was just getting shredded and breaking eventually so if it's not too awful then you can again get your nail file sometimes i peel bits of nail file off and get into those corners and file it down have a look underneath file that down too but if it's really bad and if you consistently do this then you might have to actually replace your stitch plate which isn't fun and i definitely would question if you're the kind of person that's constantly breaking needles that really shouldn't happen at all so the the people that tend to break needles a lot what is often actually happening is sorry i'm just put this back together again um what is actually often happening is that they're pulling the fabric out of the back of the machine you shouldn't do that your machine will push the fabric out when it's ready you know when it's done with it if you're pulling it what's actually happening is you're bending the needle back a little bit and you can imagine if you do that enough then that gap there is no longer big enough and it will hit the back of that or if you're putting the fabric this way it will hit that side of the stitch plate there so really your job is to guide the, you know not even guide the fabric your job is to steer the fabric so and to make sure that there's no pleats or folds or anything going in but your job is not to push it under the needle nor to pull it this way that's not what you should be doing at all also if you're breaking needles because you're hitting things at high speed then you're obviously you're actually just sewing way too fast okay sewing shouldn't be mostly you don't sew very fast unless you on a big straight line because you're doing curtains or duvet covers or whatever but generally sew a lot more slowly because then if you do hit a pin or you hit the stitch plate it's not the end of the world um and anyway if you're sewing too fast you'll be unpicking forever as well um the final thing I just wanted to talk about, about is this one is quite clean because obviously I have just reason, you know, recently cleaned it. Um, but just every now and then just blow into your um, bobbin area because it needs to be free. There shouldn't be. I mean, I found some horrors in there. Um, I found sequins and buttons and broken needles. And often when people use the pins that don't have heads on them, those pins can end up it going in here or, you know, the, the, the heads from needles, you know, the ends of the needles, um, threads, lots of threads end up in there and all of that needs to not be in there at all. So get a paintbrush, just give it a little bit of a dusting every now and then. Um, there's no real time frame for this, but you know, you will know how often you use your machine. It takes quite a lot for it to build up to the extent that it's going to cause problems, but it's best to keep on top of it. But definitely if you've had a thread jam or you know that you've been sewing with fake fur or sequins or whatever, then just have a little investigate and see what's there. I often come across machines that haven't been cleaned for so long that the grooves here between the feed dogs 
are completely full. I mean, there should be nothing in here because I clean mine regularly, but I've what, found ones where you do that and this massive lump of felt where all the fluff has just felted together and this big lump of fluff comes out that is completely dense. So, and likewise, you know, I've taken the bobbing paces out and found this, this enormous layer of felt underneath here because all the fluff just gets denser and denser and denser. So definitely keep on top of cleaning your machine. Um, and when you don't use it, cover it up um and yeah be mindful if you use things like fake fur or what have you because it will leave a lot of fluff in your machine so give it a bit of a clean any questions uh, yeah so we've there's a bit of a chat going on uh which is great yeah um, so some tips being shared so peter from fix it clinic says that they regularly yep. use wd-40 on hopelessly frozen sewing machines yes to work yeah, yes they're really really, really lubricate. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, I would. it's very rare. I tend to just try and do it by putting new oil over the top of the old oil because it does cut through up to a point. But if there, if a machine hasn't zigzagged, for, for example, if somebody's only been using it on a straight stitch and then it's been sitting in the cupboard and the, the zig, it won't zigzag, so the needle will not go left to right, then sometimes the only thing for it is to stick WD-40 on top of it. But it isn't. I think a lot of people think that as part of the maintenance, their machine needs WD-40 because it feels like it's a lubricant, but it's actually the opposite. It does chew away at the oil. But yeah, if your machine's very stuck, then absolutely I will use WD-40, but then make sure you re-oil everything because it will, I mean, some machines that, especially vintage ones that need oiling a lot, you know, they need oiling. I don't know if you use them a lot, they need oiling a lot. And I've come across ones that have been so dry, you can hear them crunching, you know, and they just really slow down. They just, so you give them a bit of oil and you let the oil run through and they're so happy again. Um, Brilliant. Um, we've also got some advice. Uh, Martha shares that she regularly vacuums her sewing machines after every project. Yeah, and that's to, to absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, because actually blowing into it, sometimes you just blow stuff further into the machine. So yes, hoovering is not a bad idea at all. Brilliant. Uh, and just a couple of questions from Beale. Yep. Uh, so uh, they ask, what can cause the thread to catch and effectively stop the material threading through, i.e. you end up sewing constantly in the same spot? Right, that is usually if you... Um, so if, say, for example, you're starting on a piece of fabric that is quite chunky. So and your the foot on your machine, let me just put this back on. Let's, let's put the whole thing back together for a second. I mean, there's a variety of reasons why this could happen. But if your bobbin, if the hook on your bobbin system is not, um, you know, if there's no barbs on there and it's not your needle, then it could just be that, like I said, the fabric you're sewing with. If you are starting, say you're starting on the edge of a, pair of jeans and you want to start on the seam and you can see this foot is like at an angle and it will not go over that lump then you might just find that it just will st stitch in place what I sometimes do if it's not instantly catching if I can see that the fabric isn't moving towards the back then I might just turn the hand wheel by hand and just gen gently force the fabric through a little bit or even you know as the needle is up lift the foot up move the fabric a teeny tiny bit along and then do it that way so but if it's constantly happening you just need to start slowly i think is the main thing so if you can see that the fabric isn't moving you really should catch that within a few stitches um and it could be that your stitch length is too short it could be that your needle is you know too chunky or that your fabric there's too many layers of fabric going on um but you need to be on top of that because if you let it build up, if you do 20 or 30 stitches on top of each other, that's it. It will never move from there again. You know, you've created a big lump that is catching under the foot. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Jenny. Um, a couple more about yep. cleaning specifically. So yep. people asks, would you recommend the use of dry air spray to clean? And Jackie yeah. also uh, adds to that saying she was told not to use your breath to blow into the machine because the moisture might cause the metal to rust over time. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to blow into, you'd have to have fairly wet breath and do it quite a lot. I generally will just blow into it. You're not supposed to, you know, I get it. You're not supposed to blow air beds up with your mouth either. So yes, I used to use, um, uh, what's it called? The condensed air that you use on keyboards and computers and stuff like that. But I actually got bit 
sick of, you know, sickened by how many canisters I was going through. And sometimes they f- it feels like there is some sort of condensation going in on those canisters also. So now I've got, um, I haven't got it down here, but it's like the opposite of a, of a vacuum cleaner and it blows air at high speed and it's got loads of different nozzles so I can get into really small areas. But yeah, I would say if you just every now and then blow into your machine, then it's not going to cause things to rust. You know, it takes quite a lot. People have their sewing machines in sheds and they don't rust so easily. So I, you mostly will be okay. Just don't spit at it. <laughs> it's good advice for, for most kinds of repair, probably. It, it, most kinds of things, really. Don't yeah, spit at yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, Claire was wondering whether you're going to touch on uh, the tension from yes. the bobbin, on the bobbin case. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm going to do next. I've just looked at my list quickly and that's the one thing <laughs> okay. I haven't covered yet. So... There is different, so on the different bobbin systems, I'm just gonna pull my camera back a little bit there. So if you have a bobbin, so if things are still not happy, so I tend not to really touch the top tension. I tend to just leave that where it is because even though this one is way out because I've moved, oh. Yes, so if you know, yeah, the top tension, as in, you know, at the top of the machine, I always have it on for, they're really, unless you're using a completely different thread, like a metallic thread or a really chunky thread, then I would just leave that on for, and that should be fine. If then you still have tension issues, and it's definitely not the needle, because most tension issues is actually because your needle is damaged, or you've put your bobbin in the wrong way around, or you're using the wrong bobbin, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're absolutely sure, and you've been maybe doing a lot of sewing, or you've got a vintage sewing machine, then every now and then, the bobbin tension might need to be adjusted. So you know your tension usually is correct if you can do that. And then when you jiggle it, it just very slowly lowers. If I was to pick up this bobbin, if this bobbin is threaded up correctly, so also make sure your bobbin is threaded up correctly, et cetera, et cetera. If, this, if you do this and the bobbin drops straight down, then your bobbin tension is way too loose. If you do this and it just doesn't drop down at all, then your bobbin te- tension might be too tight. Also, if you notice, so the, the interplay between the two threads, if your top tension is correct, but you have too much too much of your top thread is showing at the bottom. So you have loops at the back of your thread, your um, fabric. It could be that your top tension is wrong, as in you have the top tension is too loose. So you have too much top thread going in. But if you know that it's not, it's not that because it's on four and it's fine, then it could be that your bobbin thread, the tension on your bobbin is too tight and it's pulling your top thread through. So I would just say, have a little go with this screw here. So this is on the top, the front loading bobbin um, system. Also check, it could be that there's some fluff underneath here. So there's like a slidey thing here that this screw makes it either, you know, come up a little bit or tighten up. And that's what causes the tension on the bobbin. It could just be, I mean, I've come across bits where, you know, bobbin cases where there's just a teeny tiny bit of fluff underneath here and therefore, there is no tension on here and the, nothing you would do with the screw would adjust that. But you can just get a tiny little screwdriver in there, turn it one way a little bit, the other a little bit. If you turn it to the right, it will tighten the tension up. You can just have a go. If you're bobbing, if you are sure that it's your bobbin tension that's causing the problems, then have a little experiment. Turn it a little bit, do another line of stitching. If that's if it looks a bit better then do it a bit more if it looks worse then you might have gone too far etc etc now on these bobbing systems here it still has the same screw they often are covered initially with a little blob of red um like it looks like nail varnish so you might have to break through that to adjust the tension sometimes you can get into them you know when you when your stitch plate is gone you might be able to get at that screw in fact yes i can get to that one here or you might need to take it out. And then same thing, um, but check first that there's no bits of fluff stuck in this um, in this disc here, you know, this like groove here, um, because again, that can cause problems. But same thing, just adjust it a little bit and see what that does. And just, you know, have a go, have a, have a little play. You can't break anything. Um, very worst comes to the worst. If there is actually something wrong with this thing here, then you can just replace your bobbin case. Um, but definitely over time, um, 
So often on vintage sewing machines, or if people do a lot of sewing, then that screw will sometimes loosen itself a little bit or it will tighten itself a little bit and can cause tension issues. Um, but I would say definitely make sure that in the first instance you've changed your needle, you're using the, you've threaded up your machine properly. There's no fluff anywhere else. I once had to floss the tension, the top tension discs in a really high end sewing machine because there was a teeny tiny bit of fluff in there, which meant that the tension discs just wouldn't shut. And um, it appeared like there was just no tension on the top thread at all, but it was actually, there was something stuck in there. So that's another thing you can do, just get a really strong thread and just floss, <laughs> floss in the discs and um, and see what that will do. But yeah, sometimes you will have to adjust the, um, the, the bobbin tension. Brilliant. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. So one, another from people who asks, if a machine is sluggish pulling material through, what would be a likely cause for that? It's usually that it's filthy in the bobbin area. So I'm going to take this off again. I mean, it's not something I come across very often. I have to say, I did have it recently. I repaired a sewing machine and she said it's not, you know, the stitch length remained really small. And then when I opened it up, it was full of dust and fluff and threads and stuff so the way it moves you know the, the stitch length the, the, so the feed dogs go down and then when they come they come up to the front and then they come up to the top and pull the fabric back so if that isn't working properly and uh, then do check that it's not really filthy and possibly also just give it some oil on all the bits that you can get to. On some machines, you can actually get into the bottom of the machine quite easily. I wonder if I can, let's, let's have a look. I'm gonna show you on this one. So to get to the bobbin area in this machine, you'd first have to remove this bit here and it's just a bunch of big screws. You know, you just get a big flathead screwdriver, take this off. And then this bit, this screw here removes the whole bottom of the thing. And you can actually get a load of fluff out of there often. You can oil things if you need to. Um, so if it's, and then you can, like I said, you can get oil in a little bit further along. So do not hesitate to take this apart if you need to. Um, just remember which screws go where, but do, I would unplug it before you do that because you will quite quickly get to the motor, which is right there. So obviously you don't want to electrocute yourself. Um, but yeah, if you do need to get any further in, then that is generally, it's a lot more difficult on this expensive sewing machine, but generally speaking, you just take the bottom off and then you can get to the other leaf of the bobbin area as well. Perfect, thanks Jenny. And final one for now, a uh, question from Jonathan, who's asking, uh, are there any tips for the setting of the timing of your machine? So talking about the needle and the feed, uh, the feed dog position. Yeah, it's really hard, <laughs> to be honest. I tend not to fix timing because it's so difficult to do. I mean, to knock your timing out takes quite a bit. You know, it's, so it's where the timing basically, for those who don't know, which is probably most of us, the timing is so the needle goes down at exactly the correct time so that when the, the top thread, which is in your needle, it gets kind of presented to the hook in your bobbin area and the hook then goes round to the back of the needle and picks up the loop of top thread that's there. And then as your needle comes back up, your top thread gets taken round here and picks up the bobbin thread. Now, if your needle goes down at the wrong time, either too soon or too late, then your your that hook is in the wrong place at the wrong time. So that is what timing is all about, to knock your timing out it, it often means you've done something really quite bad to the machine. So if you hit a needle on something solid, like a really chunky denim seam or a, a, a needle, you know, a pin or a button or something like that, then what can actually happen is that this whole mechanism here jolts up a little bit. And especially on computerized machines, it's much more of an issue because on a mechanical machine, as soon as something hits something else, then everything stops at the same time. Whereas on computerized machines, sometimes, so even though the needle has hit something, the bobbin carries on turning for a little bit. And that's when you often get, end up with things that are slightly out of sync. It's really hard to fix. I tend to actually pass those on to, to a sewing machine shop down the road because it takes me hours to fix timing. And then often the, it doesn't. I have even had machines repaired by, you know, 
proper brick and mortar sewing machine shops and then the next time I used them the timing went again it is often a thing that you actually just need to avoid at all costs because it is quite hard to fix um I mean, very occasionally you can fix it by, if you go inside of here, there is two little um, Allen key screws behind here that regulate the needle bar. So you can actually drop the needle bar down a little bit or put it up a little bit. Very occasionally that will work. If that was the issue, if you've hit something and just that all that happened is that the needle jolted up a bit. But if it's something to do with the gears behind here, so the gears have become misaligned, it's, I find it really hard to fix, to be totally honest. That's really interesting. Thanks, Jenny. Um, we've got quite a few questions that aren't, are kind of about a variety of topics. Do you have some sure. more um, common things for us to talk through first or should we get to those kind of other questions? No, really, all I was going to say is in order to look after your sewing machine, as long as you're respectful, you know, by all means have a go at tinkering and taking things apart. Um, don't take out screws that you then don't remember where they go back. And if you, you know, take photographs and take videos of how you're taking things apart. But I would say certainly if your machine is completely broken, you've got nothing to lose by having a go anyway. And, you know, it's really empowering to know that you can fix all you really need is a nail file, a flathead screwdriver, any teeny tiny flathead screwdriver and some sewing machine oil. And you can repair an awful lot with that. And it is really satisfying to do that. I mean, the main thing is, of course, make sure you look after your machine in the first place. Keep it clean. Keep it covered up when you don't use it. Don't sew too fast. Don't sew through, you know, don't sew into need, you know, into pins or buttons or anything like that. Don't let your needle hit the stitch plate because that would that's the quickest way to knock your timing out. Um, also. But that's it. So yeah, ask away because I'm I've 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 run out of basic uh, machine repair. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> well, <laughs> what a great takeaway. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I'll go back to some of the questions we had a bit earlier in the session that we couldn't get to then. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll come back to some more recent ones. Sure. So question from Nigel from a while back, who's mending a machine where he suspects the motor is burned out um, and he can't get hold of the right motor. Is there anything that he can do at that point? Yeah, so I don't touch electrics at all because I don't know anything about electrics. So I know with vintage sewing machines, the motors are fairly interchangeable. And in fact, often they just had one mo motor that... Um, bolted onto the back i'm sure i'm sure you can you know that they're, they're reasonably interchangeable um i know my dad would just put something else in and make it work but i don't understand electrics enough so i don't touch i'm literally just deal with um you know the mechanical side of it all um if there's anything wrong with the electronics or the motor then i do tend to pass it on to people that are more qualified because i don't want to electrocute someone or Fair enough. Um, okay. Uh, then the next one is from Joyce, who asked uh, when her machine starts sewing, uh, yeah. it's just started going backwards and she has to switch it off uh, and back on about three times before it goes forwards again. Ah, no idea what's going okay. On. Um, yes, it's not it's not ridiculously uncommon. So often on computerized sewing machines, they do end up misbehaving a little bit and it is often again when they are quite heavily used and they're a bit filthy inside so I tend to find that taking them apart and giving them a really good clean and an oil inside tends to solve that and it is really bizarre I don't know why they feel like sewing backwards is the answer or the way to tell you that they need a, uh, they need sorting out but it is not uncommon and like I said usually I've never not been able to fix it. So usually it is something to do with just giving it a really good clean all the way inside. And that tends to solve it. I mean, I recently had one where the stitch length just remained on zero pretty much, no matter what you did. And then if it did, and then, and the feed dogs were going backwards instead. So, um, but yeah, it's generally just, it needs a good clean, I think. Unless it's, you know, some machines, unfortunately, some machines are not, fit for purpose even straight out of the shop and and it does always break my heart a bit when people buy sewing machines in ikea or you know lidl or whatever because they often there is no they're not they're not fit for purpose they're not often not good i mean you might have a half decent one you might be lucky but you know once they go wrong they go wrong i was told by a very reputable sewing machine repair shop that especially on these drop-in sewing machines unless you have a very expensive one, all the cheaper ones, this actual bobbin system. So this thing here lasts for about 20 hours and then that's it. So 
I mean, that's crazy, right? I guess for lots of people that might be five years worth of very light use of occasionally fixing a hem. But for me, that would be less than a week. So if you think about that, if you also think that people used to spend at least a month's salary on a sewing machine, and now you can buy one for 50 quid, that 50 quid sewing machine is just never going to work very well. And it certainly isn't going to last. All the bits inside are plastic. They're not replaceable. They're not repairable. And they often are a bad fit, even straight out of the factory. You know, I've come across people that come to my classes with a sewing machine in the box and they take it out. It's the first time they ever use it and nothing really works very well. You know, that so some of them just are a bit and unfortunately not fixable. Um, but yeah, if you know for a fact that it was a good quality sewing machine, um, I tend to mostly recommend people buy Junomi sewing machines. That's what mine is. They are so, so good. Um, I teach on these John Lewis sewing machines. I know I shouldn't probably be, you know, selling brands here, but John Lewis sewing machines are made by Junomi. Junomi are just an excellent brand of sewing machine, and I've never come across one that, that hasn't lasted many, many, many decades, um, unless you, you know, kill it. <laughs> <laughs> But some of the cheaper ones are just awful, absolutely awful. That um, actually ties into a question that Peter had. Um, he says amongst their learnings at Fix-It Clinic is that vintage sewing machines are way more durable and reliable. Yep. So he's asking what are the advantages, if any, of a modern machine? They often have a lot more stitches, but, you know, people tend not to use those stitches. So actually, I love old sewing machines and I used to teach on the old sewing machines. They might take a little bit more engaging with. So it's not, you know, it's not a case of just turning it on and not having to think about it. So in the same way, I used to drive vintage cars. And yes, you they were often not as reliable. I mean, the older sewing machines are much more reliable than vintage cars. But, you know, when there was something wrong, you could just take it apart and because it only does a few things, it does those things very, very well. Old sew machines, the older ones tend to be all metal inside and they are literally indestructible. So, you know, I have no, I yes, especially if somebody wants to start running a business or they want to sew a lot of jeans or they want to start making canvas bags or, you know, or yeah, like I said, start running a business where they want to spend eight hours a day sewing and they haven't got room for an industrial machine I would always tell them to go for a vintage sewing machine really I mean this machine does buttonholes in one easy setting a vintage sewing machine might not do buttonholes at all although you can buy amazing contraptions of which I have a few that are called vintage buttonholers and you attach it to your machine so if you have a vintage machine it might not even do a zigzag it might just do a straight stitch but you can attach a thing that you then set what you decide what size buttonhole you want and what kind of shape buttonhole you want. And then you just go right off you go and it moves the fabric rather than moving the needle. So you can still make beautiful buttonholes, even with a machine that only does a straight stitch. So, yes, I, you know, people that come to me with machines that they've had for 60 years. In fact, recently somebody brought a machine. She had two. She had a 1950s sewing machine and a 1970s one. And the 1970s one was destroyed. You know, all the plastic inside was all cracked. And the 1950s one was absolutely fine. It just needed a bit of oil and a clean. So they're often just incredibly reliable, super sturdy. Um, and all the parts are still, you know, still, you can still get all the parts for it. And, you know, even the motor burns out, you to go on eBay and buy another one. So, yes, I don't know. I mean, the the this one, this one virtually makes me tea, but then it should do for that kind of price, you know, and this is my job. So, but I do have a couple of vintage sewing machines that I use quite a lot. So I use them for quilting, et cetera, because they're just strong. They will sew through fingers, you know, they will, that you can make sales on those old machines that you can't do with this one. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely vintage sewing machines are fabulous. Amazing. Um, so there's some discussion about what vintage means in the chat. Yeah. Um, and we've also got a question <laughs> from Claire about, um, asking whether there are any machine uh, any makes to be avoided yes i was wondering if i was allowed to say that but of course i am i'm not you're not sponsored by anyone no, absolutely. So, yes, vin it, vintage yeah. i would say anything pre-1970 is on the whole amazing i mean absolutely amazing if you lift up a machine and it and it gives you a hernia then you know it's not going to bounce off the table when you're sewing it will go 
through curtains. It will, like I said, you can make, I know people that make sales on their vintage sewing machines. So heavy duty metal, all metal sewing machines from the sixties are on the whole, absolutely fantastic. 1970s onwards, they got a bit happy, too happy to use plastics and old plastic just goes. So if you have a machine that's now, you know, 50, 40, 50 years old, then you might just find that all the gears inside have started cracking and it can be a bit of a never ending story to start replacing bits of it and some bits you just can't get anymore. So, um, but yeah, if you, if you can get your mitts on, I mean, unfortunately they've become a bit desirable and there's lots of people selling vintage sewing machines for, you know, 150, 200 quid on eBay. But even then, even though that's not what they used to cost, I've picked up so many of them for a tenner and then charity shops for 20 quid etc cetera, etc cetera. but even then you know you buy a vintage sewing machine for 150 quid it'll probably last you another 70 years so it's still they're still a good thing to have but yeah generally not 1980s that's that's too new if that makes sense that's really helpful yeah thank you and yeah yeah brands to avoid absolutely definitely don't buy a singer sewing machine modern singers are awful i know shops that won't sell them most repair shops won't touch them because they are made in some random factory in china the name the the name singer has been bought and sold something like seven times in the last 10 years it no longer means anything and it's heartbreaking that people buy them because it's always been good and it no longer means anything so that's why they sell them in shopping centers and in argos and in little and you know in sainsbury's etc etc and they are awful and pretty much every single sewing machine that comes to me most of them are singers and most of them are shit sorry to say they are just not worth the money you've spent on them so I do always say don't buy a sewing machine you know in a supermarket because that's not where they should be bought you know go to a proper shop and have a conversation with somebody and they will tell you the machine that would work well for you you know go to a shop where they sell really good reconditioned secondhand machines because you often get a lot more machine for your money um but yeah don't don't whatever you do turn up you know having bought a, a singer sewing machine they are often absolutely diabolical but weirdly it's different in different countries so the singers that in america are much better quality than they are here um cheap brother sewing machines again are an absolute nightmare but they're made in a completely different factory from the more expensive brother sewing machines which are outstanding um uh what else oh there's there's all kinds of like almost no brands what is one of them now can't remember what's called butterfly and things like that so if if you don't if you've never heard of the sewing machine brand then do absolutely google it and um the other things don't buy sewing machines on ebay on the whole unless it's a reputable dealer i've had so many people they buy sewing machines on ebay because they look nice or the the selling point is they've you know they've got 700 stitches or the selling point is this used to be my mum's i don't know much about it but i think it works and then they buy it and of course they know very well that it actually doesn't work very well at all anymore or it's been dropped on the floor and i get a lot of oh i've spent you know 200 quid on this sewing machine and it doesn't work very well so do be really careful if you buy secondhand buy it from a proper shop and there's a lot of you know reputable shops on ebay selling stuff but check out their you know their feedback or you know go to a shop <laughs> just go to a shop if you have one nearby uh, really handy advice good to know about singer and yeah and it's so heartbreaking because people mm. just feel that they have this oh my granny had a singer and my mum had the singer and you know you should be able to and it just isn't that at all anymore uh, christine actually had a question about the old singer treadle machines yes um, they're amazing yeah um just a, a heads up everybody we've got still quite a few questions to get through and only about 10 minutes to do it uh, so I'm sure, you know, we'll do what we can, um, but we, at this point, we can't promise to get through any new questions that come in, um, but we'll do our best. Uh, so, um, Jen, we've got another, some more questions about bobbins, uh, if yep. you don't mind going back. No. Nope. Um, so Darren wanted to know, uh, in terms of finding the right bobbin, um, he's maybe inherited the machine and has a lot of different bobbins, but isn't sure which one the good bobbin is. So he's not sure what to compare it, you know, how to yeah, compare so it. Generally speaking, you should be able to, for almost all vintage sewing machines, you can, or older sewing machines, you can buy the um, 
the, the manuals online, not buy, sorry, you can download the manuals. So be wary of people that are trying to sell you manuals because you should be able to find it for free. So the Singer website has all the old um, manuals listed online and you can just download them. Um, and that should tell you what bobbin it takes. So, um, or if, if otherwise, if you're in doubt, then Google it. But yeah, I, I think we had, we had a similar question earlier on. If you have tons and tons and tons of bobbins, then you know, maybe just drop them in and just go, right, does this look like the right size? You know, does that look right? Does it look really baggy? Is it too small? Is it too tall? Um, but definitely you should be able to, unless it's really, I mean, I've come across sewing machines that was where I couldn't find any information on at all because they were made in some tiny factory in Melbourne and I don't know how it ended up here. So sometimes it is really hard to find, but most sewing machines, you'll be able to find something on them. Some enthusiasts will have written a blog or done a YouTube video on it and you should be able to find out what bobbins it takes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, two quick questions from Julie. Um, mm. One being, does it matter which way the bobbin goes into the bobbin case? And the same with the thread at the top. So I use the thread at the- um, The thread the on top doesn't matter, but the, okay. the, the, the bobbin thread going into, so if you look at the thread here, it's really important pretty much always that your thread comes off over the top and down to the left. So if you have it like that, it makes a P not a Q. And that is absolutely vital so that your thread comes in. And if you look at the, the lid for your, bobbin case it tells you on there too comes off over the top and down to the left same with your metal bobbin case your bobbin thread goes in over the top and coming down to the left so that is really really important your thread on top doesn't matter luckily but that if you have your thread in the wrong way around it may well cause issues um but it should also i mean again you have some uh old singer sewing machines where the needle is set in sideways and then the, very occasionally i've had ones where the thread goes in completely the opposite way around but if that is the case it should be you should either have a handbook for it if you really cannot make it work then google it because you may well find that it's one of those you know 1940s singer sewing machines where everything is back to front by the way, if anybody needs to ask me any questions after this, I am really super happy to, you know, have chats by not not over the phone at the moment because I'm super busy, but I'm happy for people to send me emails or whatever um, or Facebook Messenger chats. Just so you know, I'm happy to do that. Amazing. Thanks, Jenny. Um, the second one from Julie was what are the correct what are the common symptoms of incorrect tension? So uh, if you are sewing, so when you have, um, when you've done a line of stitching, if your tension is correct, then you shouldn't be able to tell the back and the front of the stitching, you know, from each other, they should look exactly the same. If you have, um, I haven't got any, can you believe it? I've, I've, I'm in a sewing studio and I've got no stitching right here. Let's have a look if I can find something very quickly. One second, it'd be good to show you. Um, Yes, I think this will do. So stitching should look the same. So that's the front of the stitch or the back, I don't know, should look the same on both sides. If you find you've got tiny little lumps in between the stitches on the top of the thread, the, the stitch, the line of stitching, then your top tension is too tight and it's pulling the bobbin thread up to the top. Or if it's not your top tension, it could be that your bobbin tension is too loose. More likely though, you'll have loops at the back of your work so that could be because your top tension is off if it isn't then it could be that you've missed a bit so it is also really important that you thread your machine up properly it could be that you've actually missed your tension discs and your thread is sitting to the front of your tension system or if it hasn't gone into the take-up hook or has jumped out of there then it, that will cause tension issues too, or if your needle is damaged. But yes, if you have big loops hanging out of the back of your fabric, then first of all, re-thread your machine, check that it's not that, check your threaded your bobbin up properly, change your needle, um, so, because that is all, you know, the, the order in which you would do things. But the needle being blunt or damaged definitely causes tension issues. But that is, so if you, if your tension is not correct, so this is now a really strong line of stitching. If you do this and you can pull your fabric apart and you see all the threads, then there's, there's a tension issue going on because the, the top thread and the bottom thread wrap around each other to make a thread, a, a stitch. And that wrap around should happen inside the fabric, which is obviously a very thin, 
you know, it's a very small place for that to happen. And if that wrap around happens underneath the fabric or on top of the fabric, then one of your tensions is off. Brilliant. Um, okay, we've got six minutes left and I'm going to try and get through as many of the questions as we can. Yeah. But um, for anyone, for any questions that we don't manage to get to, um, I've just put Jenny's email in the chat. It's a little bit up, but if you scroll up, you'll be able to find it there. Um, and there's also a guide on our repair wiki to sewing machines that we'll post in the chat in a sec. Um, so you may be able to find your answers there. But while we still do have some time with you, Jenny, um, yep. we've got a question from Claire who says locally they've got a guy who comes around and advertises servicing of sewing machines. And she was wondering whether that's um, ever really necessary given that they do they look after some insurance machines themselves. yeah I, I i find it an interesting one when people ask me if i will service their sewing machines it's generally because there's something wrong so i mo most more than sewing machines servicing just means change the needle you know clean it out a bit check whether your bob intention has gone off whack um and i know some shops charge you 80 quid for this when actually it takes about 10 minutes and it's the kind of thing you should just regularly do anyway so I would say if there's a problem with your machine, it might need a repair. It probably doesn't need servicing. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I know a lot of people that do get their machines serviced, but I think this is just stuff you should just do as a matter of course anyway. But then I also don't service my boiler or my car, so don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you can do all this yourself, really, on the whole. Okay, fantastic, that's, that's good to know. Um, Lots of really nice comments in the chat. Jenny, people are loving information that you've shared, which is excellent. A um, couple more questions. So Fred says, uh, this is an awesome, thank you. He's got a uh, Bernina 1000 at work. Oh, they're the best, yeah. Where the timing <laughs> has gone uh, and it's been repaired by a professional twice, but it's broken straight away both times. Yeah. It's reassuring to know you've always had that problem. Is it okay to I've... use that machine for parts or would it be a good idea to buy a broken machine uh, by, by a broken for parts machine trying to replace the bits it's difficult to know really um yeah it's difficult to know i mean to, you know see if the repair shop has any advice on that i once killed a faff a beautiful faff sewing machine by making a pair of jeans on it and the timing went and no matter what i tried i couldn't fix it and i gave it to a proper repair shop and they fixed it and within five minutes of getting it back it went again they fixed it three times and it never just it never worked again so it it yeah, it can be the because a lot of the gears are plastic. Once they're out of whack, it can just be that it just carries on continuing, um, you know. And obviously, they're extremely expensive sewing machines, and they're super, super, super lovely. I mean, you might just want to see if you can find somebody else who can have a look at it. But it can just be that it is, yeah, beyond beyond repair, unfortunately. Um, but you've got nothing to lose by you know finding parts of it you you can find most machines well you know you can buy the parts on ebay which is you know pretty good people just strip machines and sell bits so if you can find the gears and you're happy to have a go because after all it's already broken what have you got to lose that's i think at restart that's our philosophy really <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, have a go have a go i mean that's yeah. how i learned there is no course you can do to become a sewing machine repair person i learned by just having a go and just being curious going well if this bit works and that bit doesn't work then the bit in the middle has to be broken so is there a spring that's gone or is that bit out of whack or is it just filthy so that is really you know what i've what i've learned you can learn too it's, there's no magic to it perfect okay um just looking at time i think that might be all we have time for this evening um, oh. It always flies by, doesn't it? It flies by. Um, there are still some questions we haven't got to yet. Um, yeah. Apologies for people um, with questions that we didn't manage to answer. Um, but please do get in touch with Jenny at her email, um, which was in the chat. Uh, or check out our guide to repairing sewing machines that Jenny helped us create uh, in one of her previous culture sessions, uh, which we'll also post in the chat. Um, but until next time, thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing. Thank you, James, for tonight. sorting this out, because I do. I want everyone to keep sewing and I want everyone to have happy sewing machines. So. <laughs> happy sewing machines is the name of the game. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone else, for coming along and asking brilliant questions. Um, at the moment, at Restart, we are accepting uh, donations. So if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to 
uh, to our site, um, but obviously no pressure to do so. We're just happy that you're all here and interested in keeping our sewing machines happy and healthy and going uh, for as long as possible. Um, if you want to stay in touch with Restart and future sessions that we run on maybe sewing machines, Jenny, there's always demand, you never know. Yep. <laughs> but also other topics, um, you can sign up to our newsletter um, and there'll be a link in the chat shortly um, and we'll post news about it there. Or you could also sign up to our forum where we post this stuff too. Um, but in the meantime, thanks so much again, Jenny. Thank you, everybody. Have a great thanks. rest of the evening and take care. See you next time. Take care.